Do you believe in leprechauns? Can I ask you for an answer? I haven't seen any evidence for leprechauns. So you don't believe in them? No, I don't. Okay, do you believe Except in, in fairies? You don't believe uh, in those, uh, Nick, right? Nick, and, but you see, the God of the Bible is not like a being inside the universe, like a fairy or a or Thor. It's not or, about whether it's a, a being or it's about the fact that it's a claim, right? It's a truth claim. Right. Um, you don't believe in these things right. because there is no sufficient. Sufficient meaning uh, stands the test of logic. Um, okay. Hold on, hold on, Nick. Nick, ahead, Nick. Hold on, hold on. Okay. The clip that we're about to watch is a fascinating conversation between Frank Turek and a student at one of his events. The conversation has to do with truth and religion and really the nature of truth. How is it knowable? Is it knowable? Also, Richard Dawkins and some of the more atheistic claims play a role in this conversation. There's also an amazing plot twist about three quarters of the way through. I'll give some of my thoughts um, on the back end and mostly let the video play itself out between now and then. With that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. My question He's to you is one that I ask to anybody when I'm talking about religion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's to address a, a huge paradox I see that, that nobody seems to worry about. Um, so you are presumably very confident in your, in your views. You are not at all concerned that you might be wrong. Uh, oh, I could have, be wrong. That's why I continue to read and continue okay. to search. And, all right. but yeah, I'm not God. I could be wrong. You are, still, you are still very confident in your ideology and your belief system. You are very confident. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming since you're up here on a stage, you've written a book. Um, if I walk into any given room, uh, maybe not this one, I will find people that follow Islam. I will find people that are um, Jewish. I will find people that follow Hinduism. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of religions, and there have been something like over 500 probably way more religions in history that have all come and gone. Mm. Um, each, each of these followers of these various religions is utterly confident that they are correct, that their book has the, the word, the final word, the word of the creator, and they will all point to, you know, in my book, this is something that actually happened, this is something that actually happened, uh, this is something that actually happened, so therefore everything is correct, my book is right, I know I'm right. All of these people in the same room are utterly confident that they're correct and the other people are wrong. Uh, and to me it seems like a blatant paradox, because I'm assuming you would agree that only one religion can be correct. Well, if would, would you agree with that? If they're contradictory, only one or the other is right or neither are right. Okay, yes. yes. All right. So my, yes. my question to you is how do you address that, that paradox that every, all these followers of different religions, including yourself, are, are very, very confident in their views, enough to, enough to be able to assert that people in, in other belief systems are wrong? Well, it's, it's not a paradox, Nick. It's just the way it, truth works. No, it, it is a paradox. How, what, in, what, in that, in that you, all these people, they're not willing to address the fact that the, the other people across the table are equally confident, they're equally okay. certain. What do you go, mean go by paradox? Maybe I'm misunderstanding what I, you mean, I mean by that. I mean that only five people at a table, each of them has a book, they're all saying I'm the one that's right because my book said so. How, okay. do, you, how do you address that? Well, you look at the evidence. That's what you do, that's what we're trying to do here. Just okay. like if I were to say uh, four times four equaled 15 and you said, well, Frank, um, four times four equaled 16 rather than 15, you would be right and I'd be wrong. And if okay. everybody else thought it was some other number than 16, okay. they would be wrong too, right? Okay, yes, that's correct. But so, okay. so what, what types of information then do you use? Again, I'm not familiar. I haven't read your book. Have, so have, you, have you been in here for this presentation? I have not. I came in late. I'm just curious if... Oh, well... <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, yeah I'm that's, what that's we, probably that, what the presentation was about. Hey, uh, you guys want to hang out another 70 minutes? Huh? <laughs> All right, I mean, that's fair Nick, enough. you came in really yeah, late, brother. No, that's fair. Hey, I'll tell you what. Um, what we just did is we went through four questions. Does truth exist? Does God exist? Are miracles possible? And is the New Testament reliable, particularly about the resurrection of Christ? If truth exists, in other words, there is truth, and you would agree with there's truth, uh, <laughs> If God exists, if there's a being beyond the world who created and sustains the world, if miracles are possible, and we said they were because the greatest miracle has already occurred, the creation of the universe out of nothing, then if Jesus rose from the dead after he predicted it, if he really did rise from the dead, then what we call mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis would call it, the basic essentials of Christianity are true. And that's what we were talking about here tonight. Okay, um, I mean, I'm sure I... I'm sure we would disagree on a lot of those former points, but I did miss a lot of the presentation. So I'll tell you I what, take, we, I if I were to give you a book, would you read it? Yeah, 
if you would read a, a book. If I would, but if you would read you one of my book. suggestions too, I'm not gonna. If we could trade books and, and you'd read one of my recommendations, yeah, I would be absolutely be down. I, for I'm, that. I'm giving you my book, not a recommended. Of book. Of course, you'd give me your a, book. A book that my mom would recommend. Your mom would recommend it because she's your she mother. She would recommend my book. Would my you mother read would it? recommend all of my papers I've written as well. All I'm right. telling you, if you want to ask me to read a book, I will give you a book as well. And if you want what to make book a deal, will you give me? I would give you the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. I've already read it. Okay, and I'm okay now. Now let me ask. Let me ask you a question, Nick. <laughs> Nick, can I ask yes, you a sir. question? Yes, absolutely. Richard Dawkins believes there is no God, right? Yes. And he believes everybody who disagrees with him is wrong. Just as you believe anybody who doesn't believe So what's believe the paradox? The, the paradox is that only one of these people at the table can be correct. True. I, I mean that... You're saying that Richard Dawkins is right. I'm saying he's wrong. I'm saying that my view is closer to the truth than his. And the other significant difference in that situation, though, is that Richard Dawkins is not making an affirmative claim. He's not saying that something exists. Oh, sure he is. He's not. He's Richard not. Richard Dawkins is saying, is saying that materialism is true, that macroevolution is true, right. that there are no objective moral values. You're, you're pulling me into other areas of, of Richard Dawkins' uh, belief systems. I'm only here to discuss whether or not there is a divine creator, a God. You, and can, he you can talk about all these things that Richard Dawkins has said or believes in, right? Let me just pause really quick right here to say that I think that the reason that they're missing each other at this point in the conversation is that it seems to me that Nick sees religious truth claims as subjective truth claims, whereas Frank Turek is saying that, no, what religions mean with the type of truth claims that they put forward are of an, ob an objective nature. So... To highlight this point, I'm going to play a really quick, less than one minute clip from my documentary where J. Warner Wallace perfectly lays out this distinction and really the problem with viewing religious truth claims as subjective. Here's what that sounds like. Well, what are the claims about God, really? Are they just really an expression of our subjective opinions, like your favorite cookie or your favorite soda or your favorite movie? Because if that's the case, there's no point in us like, getting all fussy about making a case for why I think Diet Coke is better than Diet Pepsi. But the issues related to God's existence are different because they aren't subjective claims. Our opinions can't change whether or not God exists. I can be wrong about God's existence, but my opinion can't change it. That's an objective claim about reality. And my subjective opinion has no... Now, then we have to ask the question, well, is Jesus this God? Do we think that Christianity is the true description of the God of the universe. Now, I can be wrong about this, but it's not a matter of my opinion. In the end, it either is or it isn't, and it's based not in Jim's opinion, but in the truth claim that's rooted in the object called Christianity. So it's an objective claim about God's nature, and it can be objectively false. It could also be objectively true. So either Jesus did or did not die on the cross. Either Jesus did or did not rise again. It's of an objective nature. And I think that that is something that's being a little bit missed here by Nick. With that being said, let's go ahead and dive back in. Uh, the reason, the way I can pull atheism out of that paradox is by saying that all these people at the table, the, the metaphorical table I'm describing, are claiming that something exists, uh, something that is mutually exclusive with everything else at that table. Um, someone like Richard Dawkins would say that there is no reason to believe in any of these claims being made. Not that, uh, for example, I was speaking with somebody earlier, and, and one common argument I use, people will say, how can you be so confident that there is no God? How, like, they'll ask me that. Uh, you know, you, you're saying this, but you're saying there is no God. It's not necessarily that there, I'm saying that there cannot be one, right? Do you believe in leprechauns? Can I ask you for an answer? I haven't seen any evidence for leprechauns. So but... you don't believe in them? No, I don't. Okay, do you believe Except in, in fairies? You don't believe in those, uh, uh, Nick, right? Nick, and but you see, the God of the Bible is not like a being inside the universe, like a fairy or, a, or Thor. It's not or, about whether it's a, a being or it's about the fact that it's a claim, right? It's a truth claim. Right. Um, you don't believe in these things right. because there is no sufficient. Sufficient meaning uh, stands the test of logic, um, Okay, empiricism. Hold on, hold on, Nick. Nick, ahead, Nick hold on, hold on. Okay. Whether fairies exist or not is not a logical claim. It's an ontological evidentiary claim. Okay? okay, same thing is true with God. It's totally logical that fairies and leprechauns could exist. It has nothing to do with logic. It has to do with, there, are there, is there evidence that such things exist? It might exist? be a semantic error I'm making. Okay, yes. So Richard Dawkins says, uh, at a scale of one, one to seven, with one being I know there's a God and seven 
I know there's no God. He says I'm a six and a half. To his credit, he says that he's not absolutely certain that God doesn't exist, just like I can't be absolutely certain God does exist. I could be wrong, okay? But he is saying that everybody who disagrees with him in his view is wrong. He's saying the same thing everybody is saying when they make a truth claim. Absolutely. It's not a paradox to make a truth claim. Uh, that's not what I'm claiming, though. Uh, I'm not saying that to make a truth claim is a paradox. What I'm saying is that everybody at that metaphorical table I'm describing is putting forth similar forms of evidence. I, actually, I don't think they are. I think I, many people believe what they believe because they find it attractive, according I, to Pascal. That, but that's, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree that the basis of belief ultimately comes from a desire to believe, a, a want to believe, right? But that's not something we use in determining, determining whether or not uh, a belief is truth, right? I, 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 can no, say, a, I, no, I can't say that uh, leprechauns exist because I want to believe in them or I, mm. I, I like to believe in them. Um, All right, Nick, that's not uh, I want to give some other people a chance Absolutely. to ask questions who, yeah. who no, were actually you. here. So I, I'd be happy <laughs> to talk to you later and give you a book. The first thing I want to highlight quickly is this. If you are subtracting God from the equation, you are also implicitly making affirmative statements that need to be supported just like everybody else at the table, if you will. So if you're saying God doesn't exist, I don't believe that God exists, you are also then putting forth a godless, materialistic model of explanation for everything. Because God, people say God of the gaps, but God actually explains morality, human dignity, the comprehensibility of the universe, the level of complexity in everything from the cell to the vastness of the cosmos. An intelligent, immaterial creator explains so many of these realities. If you take him out, you're now on the hook to explain those things in other ways. And so this sort of, I've said this before in other videos, but sort of this privilege of the skeptic position where you think that you're not making an affirmative statement by subtracting God. You're just saying, I don't know, I just don't believe in God. You actually are. You're actually on the hook to support the truth claims that you're implicitly putting forward by subtracting God from the equation. So that's the first thing that I want to say. The second thing I want to say is that you hear this particular objection that Nick brings up very often where people seem to think that if you're born in America, for example, you have this tremendous privilege and that you're so much more likely to be a Christian than if you're born somewhere else. And I actually do sort of want to push back on that by saying that although you get a lot of natural cultural benefits, you also get a lot of baggage. And what I have found in various mission trips that I've been on is that in some ways it's easier for someone to understand the gospel and to hear it freshly as they're hearing it without all of the baggage that it has associated with it in America. People have a lot of little hills to overcome and a lot of misconceptions about who God really is that have gotten sort of baked into the cultural cake. And so I just, I don't know, I just think that that's an important point to make as well. The third thing that I want to say is this, is that Christ is for all nations. Christ died for all. Christ will be worshipped by all at the end of time. You can see, I'm going to pull up really quick here, um, an amazing verse from the book of Revelation. It's chapter 7, uh, actually verse 9 through 10, and it says this. After this, I looked and beheld a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, all peoples, all languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And so this is really the portrait of where um, the future is going. This is this is the future reality that's coming. It's not Christ worshipped by Americans or Westerners or white people. It is Christ worshipped and adored by all nations for having died for all nations, for having extended grace to all nations, for having shed his own blood and bought back mankind for himself, that when we have fallen short of his glory, he still comes for us like a hero taking a bullet for us, laying himself down in the act of war, and then rising up again, defeating death, and offering us eternal and abundant life in himself with him. So it's beautiful to consider that actually geography is not the primary obstacle to people and, and entering into a salvation uh, relationship with God. The primary obstacle is actually much closer. It's right here. It's right in, in the center of the human heart. It's the pride that makes one believe that they do not 
need God. It's the arrogance that one has that we all have naturally in ourselves to believe that we can be our own saviors. But the sad reality is that there's only two people in the entire history of the world who who can pay for our wrongdoing. It's either us that will pay for it, or it is Jesus himself that will pay for it. Personally, I would much prefer to apply the beautiful blood of the Lamb of God who was slain for me than I would to atone for my own sins. And I just want to say that that same offer of grace, forgiveness, and salvation is for all nations, like I said, but it's also for you. Christ died for you because if you are a image bearer, if you're a human being, then that means that he desires to be with you. So my call to action at the end of this video is consider that it's you or it's Jesus who can pay for the wrong that you have done. Why not apply the blood of the lamb, like in the Old Testament, putting it over your doorstep so that the angel of death passes over? Why not consider the path of humility, cry out to the name of the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord, and be saved? It's so simple, a child could do it, but it so rubs right at the core of human arrogance that unfortunately, we're told that the road is narrow that leads to life and broad that leads to destruction. Don't be on the broad road. Be on the narrow road. <laughs> Join us as we go towards the Lamb who will be worshipped by all nations. A little heavy, a little preachy, but that's what's in my heart for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll, I'll see you in the next one.